not quite 8 o'clock yet. <laughs> it still says 7.59. I'm waiting for it to be 8 o'clock. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hubble Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. It is my pleasure to be your host. I am Frank Summers of the Office of Public Outreach. Uh, and over on the table tonight, we have a special uh, lithograph picture for you. Actually, a whole bunch of pictures and real pictures, okay, real printed pictures from back when we used to distribute them. Since uh, Ray is going to do his talk tonight about Hubble news over 25 years, I thought it would be very appropriate to go back and give you some of the things that we used to give away. I don't know, 10 years ago, 15, 15 years ago? I think we stopped giving these out uh, almost 15 years ago, so you are getting some cool stuff. All right, and while I have it in my hand, someone handed me uh, this month's National Geographic. All right, it's got Lincoln on the cover. I don't know why Hubble's not on the cover, because uh, it's Hubble's 25th anniversary this month, and there's a spread on Hubble's greatest hits. So if you are interested in uh, seeing yet more cool Hubble images and reading about them in National Geo. It's available there. All right, uh, as I said tonight, Ray Villard will be talking about Hubble. Well, this is the title I gave him. Uh, he's got his own title, okay? I don't really care what he <laughs> wants. I gave him the title, Hubble and the Media, 25 Years on the Bleeding Edge of Science Journalism. Uh, he'll talk about whatever he wants because that's just the way the relationship Ray and I have, okay? Um, our website for other upcoming lectures and everything, hubblesite.org, go talks or just search Hubble Public Lecture. You will find lists of upcoming lectures lectures, information, as well as the archive. Uh, we are being webcast, and our wonderful webcasting team has done this since 2005, so we're up to almost 10 years worth of archive webcasts of our lectures. Um, as I tell my speakers, the live audience is wonderful, but we actually get so many more hits um, on and our webcasts and on YouTube that uh, our media audience is now online, which is kind of funky to think about. So if you want to be part of that online audience, you can click those links there and find out about our webcasts, okay? Uh, if you would like announcements, um, we have had a change over this month. We moved from one email listserv thingy to another email listserv thingy, okay? Um, and so if you want to sign up, the address is maillist.stsci.edu. About the only thing you can sign up for at that website, uh, the only ones that are public, is this public lecture announce email list. Um, or you can just provide your email address. You want to write it down on a piece of paper and hand it to me. We can sign you up. Um, we promise no spam. And now with this new software, it's even <coughs> less spammier, which there never was any spam to begin with. So uh, how there can be less? Um, if you would like to send us email, you can send it to publiclecture at stsci.edu. That does get spam because I do get the, the spam notices from those. Uh, but if you have send in, you can also send in your email uh, to sign up for the announcements or give us comments or questions. Uh, for those of you who like social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus and Pinterest and so on for myself as well. Um, those of you who, can, who are on the web are the ones most likely to do that. You can pause the video and copy these things down. I don't see anyone in the live audience copying them down. There will not be any observatory tonight, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I got the notice that it's going to be raining all evening. I haven't actually been outside. I've been locked in my office all day. Um, but he said it was going to be cloudy and or rainy all evening, so he canceled the observing session for you tonight. Sorry about that. All right, and one final thing before I start the news. Uh, it is Hubble's 25th anniversary. The launch of Hubble was 25 years ago on April 24th of this month. Uh, one of the activities that we are doing to involve the general public uh, is this Hubble National Teach-In. Uh, April 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, we are, have, we're signing up schools across the country. Teachers and students can do it in the class. Uh, it will be um, a 
educational experience related to Hubble. Uh, however, if you want to come and watch and enjoy it, it's as simple as watching a, uh, clicking a YouTube link and watching it on YouTube. Uh, you don't have to be a teacher or student to watch, um, but uh, if you know teachers and students who would like to bring a little Hubble directly into their classroom, uh, please join us for this teach-in on April 24th. All right, now news from the universe for April 2015. And since our main talk is all about news, I'm going to try and keep mine short. I'm just going to do two stories for you tonight. Uh, first story is moon shadows. And if you remember last October, we had a press release about Ganymede shadow on the great red spot. All right, where it you know, sort of looked like an eye. So much so that somebody almost immediately after the press release took that and duplicated it and turned it into that. <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of has, you know, like, oh, it's, 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 it's the great red spot Charlie Brown type feel to it and everything. All right, so Ganymede got its day in the sun, sort of in the shadow, right? Well, we actually followed that up in January of this year with three, the three other moons getting their shadows across uh, Jupiter at the same time. Here is Europa's shadow, here is Callisto's shadow, and here is Io's shadow. All right, this is at the beginning of the sequence that we took, uh, and this is at the end of the sequence. So we are able to capture a moment in time when there were three of Jupiter's moon's shadows traversing across the face of the planet. And we made this animated GIF to show you the sequence. It's going to repeat. And it's, you know, it's just a cool little moment in time, right? You know, it's nothing, it's no, there's no major science in it. These moons pass over and the shadows pass over all the time. But it's kind of cool to see all those shadows there. Now, of course, to help you understand it, um, our group uh, that does the news likes to do three-dimensional visualizations. So we did a visualization. I'm just showing you some frames from it. You can actually go to the website and watch this to show you here's Jupiter, here's Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. All right? And we're using the exact positions of all these objects at the exact moment in time downloaded from the JPL ephemerides. So we've got it all things, so all, all correct in, in, in 3D. And as you zoom in, you can see the four moons here. Now, of course, the moons aren't anywhere near that big. Okay, if you do it with the correct sizes, you, they look like this. Can you see those moons? Well, I will point them out to you. There they are. There's Io, Europa, and Callisto. Okay, just to let you know that the scale of the universe is really, really big. It's not all that stuff that you tend to, tend to look at, okay? Uh, they, they, these are really tiny things, okay? But then if you zoom in, you can see Europa's shadow, Io, Callisto's shadow, and Io, and as they move across to get through it. Now, one of the funky things that happened as we were creating this three-dimensional visualization is that if you compare the actual observations over here with Callisto's shadow and Europa's shadow, you see something funky that, wait a minute, Io isn't in the same place, and Callisto isn't even on screen, and Europa's not on screen. And you say, well, wait a minute. Did you guys mess up in your visualization? No, we didn't. What's wrong here? What's wrong here is that Hubble has an incredibly tiny field of view on the night sky. It's basically a, you know, arc, sec arc, arc minutes across, OK? And the visualization software that we use to do this, the minimum camera field of view was much larger than Hubble's field of view. So using the, the Hollywood software that we use to do these visualizations, we couldn't exactly reproduce Hubble's viewpoint, all right? although we did place our camera as, as accurately as, as possible, and all these things are anything. So there are some limitations to how we, present the, how, how we present this. To exactly produce Hubble's field of view, this tiny, tiny field of view in the sky is not something that a Hollywood piece of software would naturally do, because you're going to take a normal 35 millimeter camera a 70 millimeter camera and such, and you're not going to have that kind of field of view. It'll be much, much larger. So that's something I just wanted to point out for you guys, uh, since you guys get to hear the inside story. Second story. We're going to go away from Hubble. <laughs> Ray, this is just for you. 
a series of fortunate events. <laughs> I love it when my audience knows what I'm going to do before it. <laughs> Actually, we do have somebody who's young here. Who, have you read these books? Ah, well, the books I'm referring to is a series of unfortunate events by Lemony Snicket. There are actually 13 of these books going from the bad beginning to the end um, in these books. But that's not what we're talking about. That's the series of unfortunate events. The series of fortunate events, of course, refers to the Dawn mission that went past Vesta already and is now in orbiting Ceres. So, this has been an amazing mission. It's taken quite a long time. The launch was in September 2007, and it was on this orbit. Then it switched to this orbit to go past Mars. Then it got a gravity assist from Mars to get onto this orbit to go past Vesta. It arrived at Vesta in September 2011, um, stayed with Vesta for, over a, for almost a year, um, and left in June 2012 then boosted out onto this orbit to arrive at Ceres in, February, in actually in March of 2015, um, and will stay with Ceres um, uh, for quite some time. Some, some time. All right, so here is the, those are the different orbits that it was on. Here are the various boosts that it used to get there. All right, here is uh, just for the history of it, and then the series of events. Uh, we have the launch in September 2007. <laughs> We have the flyby of Mars for gravity assist in 2009. And this was so close that even with its basic camera, Dawn could get a picture of, of the surface of Mars that looks like that. That's how close it came to Mars. It came whipping by all right, in a really close encounter, but that is one of the pictures of Mars from it, just to show you how close it came to get that gravity assist. Is that a sand surface? Huh? The surface of Mars is mostly rocks and, 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 and dirt, uh, but it's got a lot of iron in, in it, which is, of course makes it the rusty planet. They call it the red planet, but it's more rusty in my opinion. I'm, I'm okay. Circles. Well, those the circles would be uh, crater impacts. Yeah. Okay, uh, those those would be impact crater Im, impact uh, things. This is just a single color image, by the way. Um, it was just taken in one color, so it's it's presented as black and white, not actually in full color. Then it went past Vesta, and here is the wonderful montage image that they put together of the surface of Vesta. And you can see this is, one, uh, this is a really nice uh, three-dimensional structure to so really understand Vesta as, the, as, an, as, as a real object now, instead of just being that fuzzy blob. Even Hubble's vision you know, still has some fuzziness when it tries to look at Vesta, because we looked at Vesta in advance of this mission to help them figure out what they were going to uh, look at. Um, but this is, this is great. Um, and then on March 6th of 2015, we went into orbit around Ceres, and they announced it with this wonderful animated GIF. Don's new home is around the dwarf planet Ceres, March 6th, 2015. And they've got that animated GIF going in the background to show you here is what we, this is the best images of Ceres so far. We're going to get better, okay? Uh, so as you can see the rotation. Again, a lot of those circular things, a lot, more, a lot of impact craters. But you can see that Ceres is, unlike Vesta, which had uh, uh, some non-uniform shape to it, this is mostly spherical. All right, whoops, let me go back. I didn't mean to go out. And one of the coolest things that they've discovered so far um, has been these two white spots here. They're really, really bright. It must be some exposed ice, some brand new ex exposed ice. Uh, we don't know just yet, okay? And honestly, I was expecting as we approached and approached getting better and better pictures and seeing more and more detail, but I learned out, I learned why we didn't get those. Because March 6th is not the end of it, okay? It's not in orbit around Ceres just yet. After March 6th, it made a U-turn got caught by Ceres gravity on March 6th, but this, uh, I guess that's an ion propulsion engine or something like that? Yeah, the ion propulsion engine is now driving it into its, uh, its, its scientific observations orbit. Um, and in April, which is this month, it will now enter into that orbit. And throughout the rest of April, it will then make orbit. And this is the orbit it needs to be in to do all those really cool science observations. 
Also, um, and I don't understand exactly why, but when it's firing that iron propulsion engine, it has to be pointed as this, and it doesn't take Im new images. So a lot of the reasons why it didn't get better and better images, I was expecting, you know, a closer and closer approach, better and better images, and because it's firing that iron propulsion engine, it wasn't able to take observations. So you will see that later this month, we will start to have more and more really cool images of series coming back, um, and uh, the series of fortunate events will lead us to understand the largest object in the asteroid belt. All right. Now we move on to our featured speaker, and this is an introduction that, wow, I could go on for quite some time about, because uh, Ray Villard has been here at the Space Telescope Science Institute for 29 years. All right, I can't find the, there we go. Hopefully that will bring up his slide set. Um, he started with us before Hubble was launched, okay? So he has been involved in every single Hubble press release that has ever gone out. All right. This man knows more of the history of Hubble and where the skeletons are buried than any other man out there. Um, you know, it's, you know, you recognize that you have done something, you, you try and do something with your career and to look back at what he's been involved in and the way he's handled it and Frankly, I know all the stuff that he puts up with fr from, from NASA HQ and all the, the things and trying to revise news releases at the last minute and everything. Um, he has got something truly to be proud of because his career has helped put Hubble on the map. I do not, I can honestly state that Hubble would not be the household name it is without for this gentleman. An author, uh, wrote books, wrote a television screenplay that was nominated for an, em uh, for an Emmy Award. Um, the man who's behind all of Hubble's press releases, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, Ray Villard. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. I can't pay him enough for these great, uh, these great introductions, though, huh? It's a hard act to follow. Anyway, I'm delighted. Uh, the Open Nights Frank does are tremendous, and now and then I do get an opportunity to come and talk to you all about the various topics. Uh, Frank asked me, since this is the 25th silver anniversary of Hubble, uh-oh, I don't know what that was about. Okay, I'm, oh, here, we're back, all right, there we go. So, 25th anniversary of Hubble. Frank, so why don't you talk about Hubble and culture and news in particular. Um, it certainly has been an extraordinary opportunity. And it's hard to squeeze 25 years of trying to report on Hubble into just uh, about 50 minutes or so. So I put together something fairly anecdotal that touches on some of the more dramatic aspects of this mission. <clears throat> and the mission is played out like a movie script. You, you cannot write a more dramatic. It, it beats that movie Gravity and Interstellar. Because this is reality, Jack. And, um, so I want to touch on some of the key things going way back to launch, <clears> the <throat> 25 years ago, share some anecdotes with you. Not all of them, since it's being broadcast, but that's, you'll have to read the book. But anyway, <laughs> so a kind of a personal journey through this. Um, if you do have questions about a particular picture or topic <clears> that I'm showing, feel free to, to raise your hand and please save more general questions till the end. Um, my interest and enthusiasm for this mission goes back <clears throat> over 30 years um, when I was working down at the Maryland Science Center. Uh, Lockheed Missile and Aerospace, they were doing the integration of Hubble, and they did these um, very lavish, fancy PR things. This one, Frank, they compared to Stonehenge, and it's a little, it's a little, pub I thought Stonehenge was where the demons dwell and the cats meow, but that Nobody remembers that song <laughs> from Spinal Tap, never mind. So they, they talk about, you know, the builders of Stonehenge could imagine. But it, 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 the key thing about the, the Lockheed ads was that the one ad said in 1983, man may see to the edge of the universe. And they got me really excited. I cut that out. <clears throat> I hung that over my desk. I interviewed here in 1986, 
And the scary part then was the tragic uh, explosion or disintegration of the space shuttle Challenger. The Hubble telescope was going to be the next payload the Challenger was going to launch in 1986. I was crushed. I had applied for a job here in public affairs, and I thought there'd be a hiring freeze. But thankfully, due to bureaucratic inertia, they just they kept hiring. So the, the four, I can't tell you what I did those four years from 86 to 1990. We were very busy. I did have an opportunity to see the telescope itself out at Lockheed and Sunnyvale. <clears throat> um, it was costing several million dollars a month to keep it in storage. But it was an impressive thing to look at. I'd look, at a, look through a little window, and, and there's this immense facility. But it was kind of a, a bird in a gilded cage, because it wasn't clear when was the shuttle going to return to service. Um, NASA was doing almost all the publicity. Well, they were doing all the publicity for Hubble back then. <clears throat> the news office here at the Science Center would take over, Science Institute would take over once we started getting real data. Then it gets exciting when you begin to see things. There were a number of hypey NASA videos. I don't have the video to show you, but they did do a video called The Incredible Time Machine. Well, all telescopes, even your amateur telescope, are time machines. But they took clips from Back to the Future, and it's a cute, it's a silly little video where Christopher Lloyd is going, holy cow, when they're talking about the wonders of Hubble. <clears throat> but in those years set the stage for this movie script. So this is how Hubble has changed its stripes over the past 25 years. Before launch, some people were complaining that it, it was being hyped as the be-all and end-all telescope. I think it's proved that in many respects. And it's going to cost a billion dollars, which was big money back then. Um, once we launched and the, and the aberration, the misshapen mirror news came out, we were the billion dollar blunder, and I'm going to talk about that. <clears throat> well, there are very few people who remember that today. Um, once we fixed it in late 93, we were the comeback kid, and Americans love success stories. And Hubble got pumped up, I think, to more fame and, and notoriety than it would have if it just had been launched and, and worked perfectly. <clears throat> Certainly from the mid-90s to the middle of the last decade, we enjoyed tremendous, with Hubble we picked the lowest hanging fruit, made a lot of exciting discoveries very early on, and I'm going to show you some examples. Um, more tragedy struck in this Perils of Pauline story in the middle of the last decade with the cancellation of the last servicing mission. I'm going to talk about that. But we got, that, we got that mission back thanks largely to the support of the public who, who began to treat Hubble like old yeller, right? You don't want to shoot it. Um, so the, our last servicing mission, which has made Hubble what it is today, was canceled and came back. And we've enjoyed a reborn Hubble with some of these spectacular pictures Frank has shown you. What worries me today is that a lot of the stories say the aging Hubble. Hubble is not aging any more than uh, your car might be. I mean, yeah, equipment's wearing. It's not wearing out. And the telescope is a much more powerful telescope than it was when it was first launched. <clears throat> Back in 1997, they put a new computer in the telescope, and, and Intel 486 for you <laughs> computer geeks. <laughs> but Hubble doesn't do Windows and doesn't do the Internet, so 486 works good on Hubble. So this was actually the launch 25 years ago. Um, I'm down at Cape Kennedy with the Space Shuttle Discovery behind me. It's a wonderful picture. I'm off on the, on the right there, and you can see that this mission has not aged me at all. It's really kept me. <laughs> I would like some of my hair back, but besides that, the gentleman in the middle is Professor Colin Norman from Johns Hopkins. And the gentleman at the far left, who was part of the outreach effort here, who does have some notoriety, <clears throat> who I think will get shot on sight if he comes near here, is Eric Chasen, who wrote a book called Hubble Wars. And it's a nice piece of docudrama. It's half truth and half made up, but he, he never thought Hubble would be a success. Anyway, that's us at launch. Extraordinarily exciting. The triumphant deployment back on April 25th, uh, 1990. The media were watching this very closely. One little Hubble had, you know, baby pains. It would, it would shudder when it came from shadow into sunlight. 
<clears throat> they had a problem with one of these solar arrays unfolding. Um, one night, somebody called here to the front desk, and they wanted to know about the status of Hubble. And the, and the guard said, well, and, and there was a reception here that night. And the guard said, I, I really don't know. Um, I don't think I have anybody who can talk to you. And the caller said, I just want to know about the gyros. And the guard said, I don't think they're serving those tonight. <laughs> so, so at launch, uh, the, the great author, the you know, very famous author, Timothy Ferris, really put this in perspective. And we've enjoyed wonderful editorials through the course of this mission. It says, more about us, the better we can know. It's our equivalent of building the pyramids. And Stonehenge, I guess. An interesting anecdote that's not well known, and I can't find the video, <clears throat> is that back at Cape Kennedy, just before launch, the NASA Administrator for, for Astrophysics, Dr. Leonard Fisk, was cornered by the news media. They wanted to know what the first thing was Hubble could look, was going to look at. And there was a plan to put in a program of looking at pretty objects, and that was scuttled. And it's described in Chasen's book, but his genre is a little paranoid <clears throat> about putting out too many pretty pictures too soon. And so Fisk didn't know what he was going to look at, and the media hammered him so hard he agreed in real time to show the very first picture of the very first engineering target. So in May of 1990, this was the NASA a terribly boring photograph. Here's taken with a wide field planetary camera. <clears throat> on the right of an uh, open star cluster, there's a few stars. The NASA TV script said, if the ground-based picture on the left looks better, don't show it. But <laughs> and then it had these funny little tentacles. They were like, that's weird. Well, they haven't focused it yet. We didn't know that was the signature of spherical aberration, a defect in the primary mirror. To make things even more bizarre, and then a few weeks later, um, ESA came out with its faint object camera, and this looks like a world of difference between the two little star images on the right and the fuzzy. But what's missing from this, which is, was a little bit of trickery, is that those two little star images were only 15% of the light coming through the telescope. The other 85% had been smeared into a skirt or a halo because the telescope could not come to a sharp focus. But to get this out, the image processed it and clipped off the fuzzy stuff and it looks like a world of difference. So the hardest day on the job for me here was a day in June of 1990 where NASA announced that there was a flaw, a serious flaw in the mirror. So I, and there's very, I got very little warning on this and I go back to my office, I get a call from the New York Times and I've got to make up something in real time. What does the Institute think about this? Well, people here are ready to cut their wrists and jump off the roof. <laughs> And I, so, I, in real time, I had to think on my feet and say, well, uh, you know, we're disappointed. <laughs> and then I had to stick with the NASA party line, which was true. We, we, we agree that NASA has said they will commit to repairing what's wrong with the telescope. We'll, we'll change how we do observations. But we, we, because of the shuttle, we can go back and fix what went wrong. But to come up with a quote that was politically correct and didn't get people upset was, was a trick because I had next to no warning. Of course, the mirror, yep, that's not working. The mirror had been ground with the edge too shallow by 1 50th the thickness of a human hair uh, due to the instrumentation used to direct the, the polishing of the mirror. Uh, we had to suffer through all kinds of political cartoons and we were the, <clears throat> we were the Rodney Dangerfield of, of <laughs> modern science. And, <laughs> and people said, how did you feel? I said, well, you know, you've got to live with it. The two covers that really brought me near a heart attack are here. One is an Australian magazine <clears throat> on the left. And the, the billion dollar blunder, which just sent people into conniptions. And then our beloved Senator Mikulski called Hubble the techno-turkey. And uh, <laughs> oh, I don't know where I found this, but it fit. But <laughs> and, then, and then we were becoming a transitive verb, which really made me sick. Right? <laughs> the, thing, the, the one thing in the media 
that really drove the folks at NASA crazy. And if I'd watched this movie, I would have had a heart attack. It was Naked Gun Two and a Half with Leslie Nielsen. So in that movie, if you saw that, um, this is the one scene is the blues bar, a sad singer. But the background wall had great tragedies, the, you know, the Hindenburg and the Titanic and the Edsel. And what's over there? <laughs> NASA went ape. And they really rethought how they would do their public affairs program based on that movie. They really got upset. <clears throat> of course, anybody watching it today would say, what? what? <laughs> you know, that was devastating. Uh, just for fun, the other uh, cult series, Mystery Science Theater, where they, they, they make fun of uh, old movies. There is one episode where they smash into Hubble. The, here's the pilot and his two robots. He says, I hope you got insurance. That's the $6 billion Hubble. And, it's a, it's a, and it goes down in flames when they get done with it. But <laughs> the very first, among the very first pictures, because there was no early release program, <clears throat> one of the first pictures, and this one's confusing now that I look back on it, but what we laid out here was a, a star cluster out in the Large Magellanic Cloud, I believe. We zoomed into the core. This is what the aberrated, blurry image looked like but with image reconstruction techniques, because this was a recently had some good signal to noise, we could pull out the stars. And so we were doing better than ground-based of that cluster. So even with the aberration and some image processing, we, can, we could do better. So the first few years after aberration, that's what we did. One of my favorite pictures is uh, to actually resolve Pluto and its moon Charon, the, the, really the first example of a, of a binary planet. Oh, did I say planet, Frank? A, a binary planet. <laughs> Wait till July when New Horizons get there. One thing, we looked at Jupiter, and back then, Frank mentioned we had photographic prints. Um, the photo lab, we did, did not have an image processing specialist then. We did not have Photoshop then, which lets us get away with murder, but that's another story. The, uh, so we, this was coming out of the photo lab, and freaking Jupiter was green. I said, wait a minute, you know, we can't put this out. You can look through a telescope and see Jupiter. We know the, we know the physics of what's happening in the clouds. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Chasen, said, well, that's what the numbers are, that's what the numbers are. So I talked to the, uh, the PI on the camera, the wide field planetary camera, uh, Jim Westfall. I said, Jim, we can't do this. He says, okay, Ray, you can change the color to whatever you want, because I'm colorblind. So this, uh, <laughs> our pictures are much better. Uh, we found some mystical things. We've seen several of these. The, uh, the Einstein cross is a gravitational lens. Um, four objects duplicated around the central galaxy. But again, plans were underway to repair the Hubble. And in a 1970s Superman comic, they had already thought about this. And if you look at the Superman, <clears throat> he's flying up to what's the large space telescope, and he's going to clean the lens. So he uses his x-ray vision, and he cleans the dust off the lens, not making it too hot that he melts the lens. So we didn't have a Superman, <clears throat> but an engineer, Jim Crocker, who was here, thought of putting corrective optics. It required tremendous precision, it required knowing the exact prescription problem with the primary mirror, then he built this Rube Goldberg device that would actually relay. And he thought of this honestly while taking a shower. And it wasn't that he got his best ideas, but he was playing with a shower head. And this, this was a European shower head. It had XY translation. And so this little gadget for the first generation instruments, it intercepted the, the aberrated beam, corrected it with very precise mirrors that had the opposite uh, uh, error ground into them. And uh, a, a mission that was incredibly triumphant in December of 1993, which the public and CNN were transfixed, was the repair mission to Hubble to replace one of the cameras with a, with a newer camera, which, which had uh, uh, contact lenses built into it and to retrofit the other ones. So very excitedly, we put out the new pictures. This is what I was talking about. Before this device called COSTAR, corrective optics 
axial telescope assembly. Before that went in, most of the light had been thrown into the skirt. With the optics corrected, all of the light of a star. So the one picture that was seminal, that went everywhere, was looking into the core of the galaxy M100. And we were so used to the Hubble pictures, one of the astronomers who was on this early release program said, you know, that doesn't look bad. I said, yeah, you know, that doesn't look bad. I wonder what the new one will look like. <laughs> so this was the sharp image. Uh, Senator Mikulski had the honor of holding it up at Goddard and saying the trouble with Hubble is over, thanks to the wild field planetary camera. And I wrote cue cards for her on the back of the picture over the dining room table. So then, of course, we had these fun cartoons, Mr. Magoo and, and Eye Cleaner and, uh, and you know, <laughs> optics test. But this cemented Hubble's legendary status. There were a series of documentaries. This looks like, again, like gravity, right? The, but it's really amazing Hubble rescue and, and all that business. Uh, the, the program Tool Time had the uh, crew with their multi-million dollar instruments and tools. So, th so they were celebrities. But in 1994, we really turned the corner with the unexpected appearance of a comet that had been ripped apart by Jupiter's gravitational field, Comet Shoemaker-Levy. And that was headed toward a collision with Jupiter just six months after we repaired Hubble. Much to the chagrin of my image processor, I said, we need a picture that tells a story. And I don't like these pictures. So we made up a picture. So we took a Hubble, and we said it was made up. <laughs> we took a Hubble <laughs> picture of Jupiter, we, we put in the Hubble picture of the comets, and blammo, they were coming toward Jupiter. And I thought it was a great piece of photo illustration. It was widely used. Now the public, were, they were getting a little crazy about this, um, <laughs> which I love. But I will tell you, I was one of the few people in NASA public affairs who thought that something might happen. I had a number of scientists and people say, you know, it's like spinning into the ocean. That comet is not going to do anything. So it was a tremendous shock when a young team of astronomers, because the older astronomers didn't want to get egg on their face, so they sent the young astronomers, working with this right below us in the control center. Um, looked at the first image and they were flabbergasted. There's a great video, a jaw-dropping moment uh, when we looked at the first impact, and this was a picture widely disseminated. The internet was coming of age, which is an important thing, and these pictures were suddenly going on the internet. We were a little bit behind. We had to actually make a photographic print and upload that to the internet. But here's the first impact leaving this mark on Jupiter. And this was probably the most extraordinary and exciting time I've spent on the mission, seeing something happen. Unveil, you have no idea what's happening. Every day we would look at new pictures from Jupiter. Hubble gave us the best view ever. <clears throat> and the article stopped saying the repaired Hubble. Now it was just Hubble, the amazing Hubble, the spectacular Hubble and whatever superlatives I could bring up. That's a serious impact. This, that's how big that one of those impacts would look if the same comet had hit the Earth. And of course, we believe Jupiter is, uh, helps deflect or gobble up some of these uh, comets. So I would say after mid-1994, um, Hubble became legendary as the telescope, right? Everybody wanted a Hubble. Now, some of the media got carried away. My favorite publication, Weekly World News, uh, had this thing. <laughs> <clears throat> and what, what made me sad, I, I've had several phone calls on this because people thought this was real. <clears throat> and I said, I said very politely, I said, that's not, they don't tell, they don't tell the truth in that newspaper. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where did that publication from? It's published out of Florida, published in the same room as the National Enquirer. And we, one of the reporters we had here was Mr. National Geographic. He worked at National Enquirer. And I said, what was the hardest thing about moving from National Enquirer to National Geographic? He said, I had to take a pay cut. <laughs> he said, Enquirer, we tell the truth. Those guys at Weekly World News, they're wacko. They just make, they just make stuff up. <clears throat> You've seen it a million times, but I do want to tell you the story behind this. 
The amazing, of course, what's in the middle of this picture that you've all come to revere? Star formation in the Eagle Nebula. Um, this is a view from the ground, and, and these elephant trunk features are common to all star forming areas. They, they're resisting being eroded by bright stars. The people on Hubble thought this one was particularly photogenic. It was relatively nearby, and we could see it at John. <clears throat> when NASA called me and said we were going to do a press conference about elephant trunks, I said, are you crazy? You know, are you that desperate for news? And then they showed me the picture, and I was awestruck. There's an interesting story behind this picture, though. They got it to fit into the, the strange field of view of the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2. I'm always asked about this. That was the budget cut <laughs> to that camera. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> They couldn't, they couldn't fix all the detectors, and they, that one went. And the, uh, but the astronomy, you notice that, but the story I want to tell you, you notice there's a difference. This shows the glow of hydrogen. So this is really a natural color picture. The colors are a little funky here. You've, the stars have turned pink. So the astronomer who did this, Jeff Hester out at Arizona State University, came up with a new technique for processing the color. And let me just show you technically what that meant. So if you look at the eagle, Oh, this is a different target, but the same thing. Looking at emission from hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, two of these glow in red light, and the other one glows in cyan. Now, the pictures we take are black and white. The colors are added to correspond to the filter once we get it. But if, if I do that and I combine it, I get something kind of sickly looking. It looks like milk of magnesia. So um, Dr. Hester came up with the idea, why don't we do the full spectrum, and we'll color the middle wavelength green, so I've got Roy G. Biv here, and that makes for an aesthetically nicer looking picture, and one could argue with more information about the target than, than the other one. So that was used on the Eagle, and of course, after years of lobbying, <clears throat> we got everybody to agree to rephotograph it with our newer camera, and this reached a circulation of about a billion potential readers when we released this earlier this year. So there's only one Beatles, there's only one Eagle. And back in the mid-90s, my video producer and I came up with this title, Pillars of Creation. We were just looking at the picture, thinking of something cool we could say about it, so the name stuck. Uh, back in the mid-90s, Hubble was showing us there was an undiscovered country, there was a, there was a new universe. I mean, at, at, at very great distances, beyond a few billion light years, galaxies started to get ready. They started to see evidence for galaxy evolution. These were tantalizing pictures. And after much debate, the uh, institute director at the time, Robert Williams, decided to make a million second long exposure, which became the legendary Hubble Deep Field, which is everywhere. And since then, we've gone deeper and deeper, which I'll come back and talk about. We look at a region up uh, near the Big Dipper, again, a million seconds. And just to make sure the universe looks the same in all directions, we did a southern deep field, although, frankly, it looks different. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's the exposure, Frank. <laughs> so this is Hubble's, all these deep fields, looking all the way back over 10 billion light years, almost to the beginning of time, or one of Hubble's greatest legacies. Another one, which was a little bit contentious, which I found very exciting, was the discovery of circumstellar disks <clears throat> in the Orion Nebula. And I was so excited in the press release, I wrote this increased the chances for life in our galaxy, because these are considered the construction yards for planets. This was before planets had been found around other stars. This was the mid-90s. We were just on the cusp of finding extrasolar planets. But the fact that the first baby steps were taking place in a star-forming nebula, I thought was very exciting. I got all pumped up and NASA said, don't say it increases chances for life. And I don't know. I think it does. Anyway, this was hypothesized, among other people, by Immanuel Kant several centuries ago, that the coplanar aspect of the solar system um, meant that this is the skeleton of a disk of material that the planets coagulated around the newborn sun. But now we had direct visual evidence for such a thing. So these little things called proplids, 
uh, by, the, by the researcher Bob O'Dell. I didn't like the name. It sounded like something you'd go see your doctor to have removed. <laughs> but the proplids. But then there was a competing team that got kind of, kind of um, snarky. And they thought these were not disks. They thought you were looking down on top of one of these elephant trunks. So if I look at a cone, and again, elephant trunks are everywhere. This is a Hubble picture of a star forming nebula. You can see the little stalactite features. So I had the pleasure of showing this critic a picture of one of these proplids seen at John. And his jaw dropped. And he said, well, I guess some of them are real. But so Frank has done a beautiful animation of this. Is that online somewhere? Um, you fly up to one of these. Yeah. The fly yeah. So this really shows us, Hubble really showed us the early embryonic stages of planet formation. 1997, we were presented with the challenge of two new instruments on Hubble, an infrared camera and a, a, a spectrometer, imaging spectrometer. Infrared was a challenge because it's not as sharp. It's longer wavelength. So the images are a little bit fuzzier. This is looking at Orion, but we can see deep into Orion in the infrared. Then we have to deal with, with false color because infrared, we have to arbitrarily assign colors to infrared. So a lot of the pictures suitable for hanging do not come from that camera, the near NICMOS, near infrared multi-object spectrometer. And then we had another spectrometer, um, the STIS, stubble, stubble, <laughs> Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. It was great, though. It was great at finding black holes. This shows the Doppler effect of a that quickly spinning the blue shift and red shift. So we put this out. We didn't expect anybody to understand it, but it looked pretty. And um, I, will, I do want to talk about the most infamous picture taken with Hubble. And we got tremendous publicity with this back in 1998. This was announced as the first picture of a planet outside of the solar system. So there's a, a stellar a star here and a weird little finger that goes down to this object. And with great fanfare, there was a televised NASA press conference that said this was a planet. And, and, and the hypothesis, which got a little more bizarre, was that the planet was ejected and had burrowed through interstellar dust, I guess, and, and light was going down this, this light tube. Got tremendous publicity. Um, the astronomy, a lot of astronomers got angry because it was not a refereed paper. Uh, but NASA pushed very hard. They thought this was so exciting. They did their own refereeing. And so this, we were tarred and feathered with this for a while, but we were doing what NASA asked us. And in fact, a refereed paper came out. Uh, still, it has become legendary as the, the Terabi planet after the young researcher who saw it. Um, people now and then will dredge it up and say, well, you know, back in the mid-90s, you guys were out of control. But I looked for this today, Frank. If I go on Astro PH, there is a paper about this object that is still calling it a candidate protoplanet. The researcher thought it was a background star. There are ongoing ground-based infrared observations. It's weird, whatever it is. It goes through, it goes through pulsations and all kinds of things. Um, from the 90s, the other big thing was to find, uh, to measure the expansion rate of the universe. Here you see, we use supernovae for that. I did have a picture with little arrows, and I used to say that God put arrows, but you've got to find the supernovae yourself here. My little anecdote behind that, and again, there won't be a quiz, but the, one of the researchers on one of the teams came to me with a graph like this. Now, if there was... If there was no, this was the, the evidence for dark energy, a mysterious repulsive field that is pushing the universe apart at ever faster rate. So the researcher, Bob Kirshner, up at Harvard came to me. He had a few of these supernovae plotted. If there was no dark energy, the supernovae would fall along that line. But they were off of that line showing that some sort of acceleration was taking place. I was all excited, reported it to one of the top people at NASA headquarters, and they said, Ray, I don't believe it. So we had to do a press conference. I don't believe it. You only got three data points. Well, the, the news finally worked its way out. And in fact, the Hubble observations are so good, they can measure the deceleration of space under the gravity from dark matter for about the first, uh, up until about seven or six billion years ago. And then this dark energy kicks in. 
because the volume of the universe is so much bigger, and it goes nuts. This is the, the, the only Nobel Prize from Hubble. These are the two teams that won that Nobel Prize. <clears throat> Saul Perlmutter out of Berkeley, uh, Brian Schmidt down at the Anglo-Australian Observatory, and Adam Reese right across the street here at Hopkins. So Hubble can get people Nobel Prizes. Uh, let me fast forward into the more melodramatic era for Hubble. And here I am at the launch in 2002 of servicing mission 3B with Wendy Friedman, who was one of the key dis people who measured the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, this was a, the geniuses down at Goddard did, really did a great job. The, the, uh, the infrared camera ran out of coolant, it failed, so they put a big, a big ass radiator on the outside of Hubble. This is like some crazy thing I would think of at home. But they came up with this very clever design, and, and the NICMOS continued to work. We put in an incredible camera, the uh, advanced camera for surveys, and we had a beautiful early release program. And this was the high watermark for Hubble publicity. We had four pictures from that camera make the top of the fold, which is a quaint 20th century term, of the New York Times. NASA went nuts. They thought this was the greatest thing, and they keep telling me, when are we going to get four pictures at the top of the fold <laughs> in, in the New York Times again. But these were targets that we had selected. There was some debate over what to look at. The one that got most attention was one of these elephant trunk features, which the, the PI on the camera didn't even want to look at. But we said, oh, it looks cute, it looks kind of weird, let's look at it. We made it a nice blood red color. And it, uh, this is the, the famous cone nebula, very famous among amateurs. And the other one, people ask me, what's your favorite Hubble picture? This is my favorite. This is the Tadpole Galaxy, interacting galaxy. What, I'm, what excited me about this was not the galaxy itself, but what was in the background. And I was floored. I must have stared at that picture for five minutes. I said, this is the way God intended the universe to be seen. You have myriad galaxies, interactions, shapes, colors. I, it was staggering. Here's the title tale of the interacting galaxy, but if you look here, you can hardly see it, but there's a funny little wisp here, maybe a globular cluster that came through that galaxy. You could look at this on a high-resolution monitor. You could look at this for forever, and it, it just made the universe something completely different than, than I had thought about. And it got a lot of publicity, too. The high-water mark for Hubble came. The New York Times was, in 2002 was so amazed by these pictures. Um, my favorite quote, let me try to read it. Beyond the uniformity of the naked eye universe, there's another universe, the one Hubble discovers with astonishing clarity, a place full of discordant objects, cataclysmic disturbances, galaxies devour each other, stars form infernos of gas and dust and light, and they do so against the backdrop of the sky that is unimaginably deep, exciting, poetic, mind expanding. And these pictures impressed the media and the people of the New York Times to write this wonderful piece. A couple more anecdotes. About that same time, we discovered a, a, a minor planet, an icy dwarf, whatever you want to call it, a little bit bigger than Pluto. And that started the debate whether Pluto really is a planet. Um, I called the researcher, uh, Mike Brown, out at Caltech. I said, it needs a name, Mike. You know, it had, an, it had a license plate number. And so Mike wrote me back. He said, I've got a name for it. It's called Quaro. And I'm like, what? This is something only Barbara Walters can, can say. It sounds like I just came out of oral surgery. So I wanted, a, I wanted a sexy name that you'd get on Star Trek or something. So it's named after a, a Southern California androgynous god of some sort. But I don't know. So then we aimed the Hubble at the moon with the new camera. And we were amazed by the clarity of what we saw. <laughs> it was, uh, this is my gullibility, oh, there's the budget cut. This is my gullibility test. No, no, we did, <laughs> we did look at the moon in support of the NASA plans to go back to the moon. NASA directed us, and invoked the prime directive to use the telescope to go look at this. So we actually photographed the Apollo 17 landing site. I'd actually proposed 
as a, as a Hubble Heritage picture to look at these landing sites. You could not see the lander or the footprint, but the, the, the thrust from the LEM, the landing module, would have scoured the regolith, and it should be a little bit brighter. And I thought we could see that. And remember, back in the early part of the last uh, decade, there was all this idiotic craziness that we never went to the moon. And I thought if we had a picture, well, the crazy people still wouldn't believe it, but it, it would be a picture. Now, Hubble's fortunes changed dramatically um, in early 2003 with the tragic breakup of the space shuttle Columbia. And that was a huge game changer because people at Goddard were hard at work on the final servicing mission, SM4, to Hubble. The Bush administration really wrestled with this. What do we do with the shuttle fleet? What do we do to make things safer for the astronauts? Um, President Bush decided to launch the, uh, what did he call it, the uh, Vision for Exploration. And with a lot of fancy NASA animation showed, showed ships going back to the, manned ships going back to the moon and going back to Mars. But Hubble wasn't part of that equation. And the argument is that it's okay to send the shuttle to the space station because if something gets broken on liftoff, as it did with Columbia, they had a safe haven. But to fly solo to Hubble was, was too risky. And the trouble, the argument was, anytime you go up in a shuttle, it's going to be very risky. There was a scaling editorial by Bob Capers from the Hartford Current, and this really summarized the feelings of some of us NASA was simply not communicated to science. Run by bureaucrats, there's no glory in science. They're obsessed with manned spaceflight. And Hubble uh, became irrelevant to that. Um, there was a wonderful editorial in the New York Times. And I guess I can't read it, though. Can I read it off here? In fact, the pictures Hubble has given us rank in importance with the Earth rise from the Apollo moon landing. So Hubble was right up there with the other great accomplishments, and the media uh, picked up on that. Now, a friend of mine, Joe Tedarevich, a uh, Hubble historian, said, Ray, you know, it sounds like this is the end of Hubble. You can't upgrade the gyroscopes. You can't put new instruments on. He says, but you know, Hubble has always come back from the dead. So <laughs> Hubble. <laughs> The history of Hubble has been on the precipice of disaster, and it comes back. So our story over the past 25 years has been the perils of Pauline. Um, um, the NASA administrator, Sean O'Keefe, did go to Goddard and say, why don't you build a robot to do it? And he knew damn well Goddard did not have the time, uh, really, to do that. These, these were designs. <clears throat> An automated craft with a shuttle arm would dock. This little robot, which is a duplicate of what's on the space station, would come out, and it would robotically have tools to pull stuff out and rearrange stuff. Goddard had the technical capability, but it would take years of development for that. Now, but, but Sean O'Keefe did have a, a plan B for dealing with Hubble, and these are un undocumented, but I think I can share them here. This was, this was plan B. Uh, <clears throat> I, I get paranoid. I think one word, well, I'll avoid that. So anyway, along came, uh, <laughs> I forgot his name, Mike, <laughs> the next NASA administrator, Mike, help me out here, Fred. Griffin, thank you. Uh, along came Mike Griffin. And under pressure from the public and from Congress and studies about the safety of going to Hubble versus the space station, he reinstated the servicing mission. He told us we had to do it at lower budget, though. So we looked at ways to lower the cost of getting parts up to Hubble. <laughs> and that was, that was one idea. We also thought about a 300-mile-high ladder. <laughs> now, you know, you've seen this guy. That's Frankie. So you know I'm just pulling your leg. This is a very historic picture, though. Um, this is the launch, the last Hubble servicing mission. And right next to the shuttle is a backup rescue shuttle. And I don't believe NASA had ever done that. But that was the solution to going back to Hubble to, to be ready to save the crew in case the shuttle is damaged. 
Now, this was an extraordinary mission. Hubble, this is one reason Hubble is in incredibly good shape with new gyroscopes and such. There was, I will tell you though, the scariest moment in my entire tenure on this project happened on that mission in all seriousness. And these are video, this is a video frame. They had to unbolt the $100 million wide field planetary camera too, which is the size of a baby grand piano, and plug in wide field camera three with extraordinary infrared capabilities. But as you know, you, you homeowners, you go to um, unscrew something, right? And the bolt won't turn. And that's just what happened. And, and you can see the, the video. This is the video. They've got their tool. It's a torque limiter. And it would not turn. And on the NASA audio, they say, well, turn off the torque limits. Turn it as hard as you can. If it breaks, it breaks. And wide field camera two stays, stays in. And, and I'm not making this up. My heart was thumping. It didn't help that the NASA public affairs guy, Johnson, said, end of mission, guys. <laughs> you can't come back to Earth with a $100 million new camera that you can't install. Okay? This is, and it's not just me talking. This was the Goddard Project scientist uh, down at Johnson. <laughs> and Dave Lacron. That's a video capture. Now, why is he doing that? Well, he's doing that because the, actually the bolt came loose. <laughs> he's like, oh, gee, thank God. Oh, I have a career. So, <laughs> this was, so this was the highest moment of drama and by far the scariest moment for me on the mission. Um, unlike the previous administration, President Obama called the crew and, whoop, why is it going backwards? What am I doing? The previous servicing mission, Obama called the crew to thank them. And one reason he did, we managed to get a picture of Jupiter into the Oval Office. The back room, not the office. But, but the story goes that it, was, it, it made its rounds through the White House and finally Obama said, I want it. So he's reminded of that. The one thing the new camera gave us was this extreme panchromatic capability. The idea to go from ultraviolet to near infrared. So that camera has this wonderful palette of colors. And to show you for us, here's a, here's a visible light image of a globular cluster where the stars are crammed together. We add the capability of adding ultraviolet and infrared. We can really stretch those colors. We can see red giants these helium burning stars, and every little white dot there is a star just like our sun. And even, you can barely see it, but um, there's a bunch of little red dots that are right dwarfs. Um, we had a lot of fun looking at the horse head. Now this is a very, this is ground based. This was a Hubble picture, underexposed, but we looked at it in infrared, and that iconic image really came to life. So much so that the entertainer Elton John Rhoda, I said, we'll give you a print, but send us a print back with your name on it. So that's out in the hallway. And then we came up with the most glorious, multicolored view of the universe ever. And with all these infrared and ultraviolet, and this will be in the history books for many, many years to come. And I'm glad it impressed the Huffington Post, right? Holy Hubble, Batman. So with each mission, we go deeper still. Of course, with Webb, we'll go out to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. With Hull, we're working on an even deeper field, though. There's a debate. We have all kinds of names for the, for the extreme deep field, the la, la, la. So this is the next deep field that's planned. And we think this will, uh, this will settle that for Hubble. I will say, and Frank will certainly agree with me, it is a delight coming to work every day to look over these pictures. Um, here's our genius image processor. I think Zoltz given talks here. A um, couple of our astronomers and my science writer Donna looking totally quizzled as, <laughs> as this astronomer explains what's going on in this gorgeous mosaic in the Lodge Marginal Cloud. Let me finish up with just a couple of anecdotes, pictures that have driven people crazy. One was the breakup of an asteroid, an asteroid collision. And I had emails where people thought this was a Klingon the warship decloaking. I don't have the picture. Somebody photoshopped this to death. He got an alien face out of it. 
And he said, I said, sir, politely, you photoshopped it to death. He goes, oh, I didn't do anything like that. So, and, and, now, and now and then I'll get an email, is this still coming toward Earth? And I'll say, yes, you got about two weeks. And uh, <laughs> I did. I did make the mistake, I, did, I, I learned not to do this, but got an email from somebody, does Hubble see UFOs? I said, yes we do, but we throw the pictures out. <laughs> because satellites stray through the field of view. And I go home that night and, you know, on some UFO site, and Mr. Villard of the space says Hubble sees UFOs. Um, we do have the Hubble Heritage Program, and we're always trying to c come up with cute names for these things. So. One of our staff people, this is a, I believe this is a massive star with a very violent outflow, but she called it a snow angel, and we put it out in December. Boy, did that click. That, that worked great. That, that got a lot of coverage. This one, we didn't come up with the name, but the astronomers call it Gomez's Hamburger. So this is an edge on. So our press release said, hold the pickles and hold the lettuce. The, the most, to me, the most infamous one, we had observed um, with our high resolution, a storm erupting on the planet Uranus. And um, it, Uranus usually is featureless, but now it's in, it's in the, uh, I think it's summertime on Uranus. So uh, this is actually from the email, and we wrote a little caption, and my title was Hubble Discovers Dark Spot on Uranus. And, uh, <laughs> this went through about eight reviewers. And I got to NASA headquarters, which was a WTF. <laughs> really? Really? Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, <this> <laughs> it was Ray, you ignorant slut. So, so this is real correspondence. I couldn't make this stuff up. This is real correspondence. Um, the one I was a little chagrined about, we try not to be too silly, but our friends at ESA dredge this out of the Hubble archives. <laughs> that, that was just a few months ago. That thing went everywhere. I'm like, how low will I stoop for publicity? So <laughs> let me finish. So what's planned? What is not going to happen with Hubble is this, although there were, there were pirated pieces of illustration floating around. There, there will be no plans to return humans to repair Hubble. Hubble is what it is. Hubble is doing great, by the way. If you look at the the projections of how the instruments are working and the major systems are working, we should easily make it to the year 2020 and beyond, which means we should be up there when the James Webb Telescope goes up. It has the spacecraft, unless they fall into the ocean because of a rocket failure. The last observatories last much longer than their, than their planned lifetime. But of course, the excitement here at the Institute is the James Webb, which will be 100 times more powerful than Hubble, and a wonderful telescope with a mirror the same size as Hubble with a much wider field of view. So this is high definition Hubble. I mean, I need a good name for it. The James Webb, I wish I had got to name it, I would have called it GoldenEye, right? That, that sells. So, so Hubble Deep Field is that big. This thing will look at, a, we'll see, Hubble Deep Field has about 10,000 galaxies. This, this wide angle Hubble, for about the middle of the next decade, we'll see a million galaxies in one exposure. And it will tell us a lot about extrasolar planets. <clears throat> so these are all going to be controlled out of the Institute. And where plans are underway for a new observing facility here at the Institute, I can share that with you. But that's what we have in the works. <laughs> so the director will put on a cloak. <laughs> look over here. We look over here. Now, this is a simulation because all the stars are the same magnitude. So, <laughs> through the effort of a lot of people, our wonderful new staff here and all the astronomers and NASA, Hubble has become a household word. We have a lot of Hubble envy from the other observatories, but Hubble earned it the hard way. It was a perfect storm of publicity. You couldn't, you couldn't stray, it just happened, the aberration and everything about it. Or household word. And a personal note, I do want to uh, end with this. I was down at the Air and Space Museum Annex at Dulles. Um, these are my grandchildren and my, my oldest boy. And here's the discovery behind them. And when that launched, he was 10 years old. So I looked at that 
And I'm like, wow, time goes by fast when you're having fun because I've got a whole new family here. Okay, great. Well, that's every, all my little anecdotes. And um, I'm open for questions. So the question is, there's a failure of, of um, a NASA's part of feeling the failure of uh, nerve to... Yeah, there's a lot of young guys. If you're 50 and you're interested in this and you can do it, you, I, you would go. I, I, well, I was I in, in, space, so. uh, in terms of, of uh, space observatories, the James Webb is a, a very... It's so much new engineering. It's, there's a high risk level but NASA is testing that James Webb telescope to death. And they better, because this is an $8 billion facility. That sounds expensive, but people spend that on dog food. <laughs> also, if you built Hubble today, it would come in at about $8 billion. But, but Webb represents the very best of our engineering and technological prowess. So there's no timidity on what the people building web uh, have, have, have done. You're avoiding my question. <laughs> <laughs> you said somewhere along the line that when the Samsung died out to fix home, and they decided uh, that it was uh, too dangerous. Well, the, the, from the last, cent the last century, the <laughs> last <laughs> decade, uh, I would argue that it was a cover story that Hubble was not part of the vision for exploration. If I want to get really paranoid, I would argue that there was an evangelical component because every time we say something's billions of years old, I get hate mail. So that's my own paranoia. It was not relevant to, so the idea that it's too dangerous, in my opinion, was a cover story. Space travel is inherently extraordinarily dangerous. So yes, but that was, you are correct. was so political. The astronauts yes. were right. enthusiastic about yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And I have all these people sign up to go one way to Mars. So that's <laughs> like No, no, the question is. Yeah, sorry, we're rich. rich. <laughs> my, my question <laughs> is will the web with its near infrared be able to see heaven better? He's pulling off the wheel of the world to his follow up. Oh, heaven. You know, there's a great story about heaven. There was a follow up to that where astronauts. Astronauts flew to heaven on a shuttle, but there was a force field. First heaven was all gold, and there was a force field around heaven, so the astronauts, I'm like, why does God need a force field? <laughs> also, the <laughs> idea that heaven is a right ascension and declination for you amateurs, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> but I had people that were dead serious, they, they, their hearts were broken when I had to tell them there, wasn't, there was no such picture. I worked on uh, Gemini, and uh, uh, crew safety was my subject. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to one of the astronauts, and uh, he said, why did you spend a half a million dollars on the malfunction detection system for this missile? We would have flown it without the right. malfunction detection system. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, uh, yeah. Uh, what about the, the sort of curve of expectation over the last 30 years? I mean, it seems to me uh, before launch, as you mentioned, there were great expectations about the Hubble, and then with the aberration, that all collapsed, and you probably had some expectations again that they weren't going to be as 
great as initially thought, and then have expectations actually far outstrip what you had originally. <laughs> oh, without doubt. And I will tell you, I've been involved in <clears throat> communicating astronomy for 40 years. It was more boring before Hubble went up. The, the rate of discovery, except for planet generations, Hubble has really just revolutionized so much and touched so many areas. Things have been and fast forward. It, it vastly exceeds what I ever imagined. And frankly, after following this mission for as long as I have, I, I feel dumber <laughs> and more humble because every day, literally, something new comes through the door you didn't think about or you never saw. So it, it really, uh, all the you know, people that accuse us of hype, but all the Hubble is, you can't live without it, it has accomplished things vastly beyond my imagination, and I would argue the yeah, imagination of the people inside. When, when it was proposed. Hmm? I was just going to say it has raised the expectation of the public mm -hmm. that they expect you know, some great Hubble images every year. And in our committees, when we start trying to discuss what we're going to observe next to release a, a gorgeous image for the holiday or something like that, I don't top we've already done something. <laughs> 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 yeah, so if you're already on top, it's like been there and done that. But that's why the sign of face is good. In 93, you pointed out the Shoemaker Levy. And uh, Frank wasn't here at that time, but this was communication central for the whole of the East Coast, all the scientific facilities and museums and so on and so forth up and down the East Coast. This is where it was happening. It was being fed from Houston, but this place was television cameras and wiring and, well, you were here. Oh, it was extraordinary. And I'll tell you a funny story. <coughs> you all know about Ryan, who was with CNN? Um, he was here recording live. My video engineer accidentally left on a security camera that was looking into the control room. So all the reporters were here, but Miles was across the hall. CNN really got a scoop on that impact because he was watching the security camera and he saw everybody doing this. And I, I thought I would die, but we, the, it was such an exciting in, uh, picture that the, one of the key investigators, Heidi Hamill, gate crashed a, a warm-up press conference that was going on here. So that experience was extraordinary. But again, I, to me, most people said, don't bother, don't, don't, don't bother, right? In fact, uh, Neil Tyson's predecessor told me that, which is why, <laughs> why he's not at the, uh, at there the was uh, good, AM and H. There's very good arguments for saying that nothing was gonna yeah, happen, okay? Great. And I can make the scientific argument that yeah. you, know, you really should expect nothing. But that was fortunately wrong. With Hubble, you have to expect the unexpected. And that's true across science. Let's see, over here. Uh, just a two-part question with regard to presentation down the road. First of all, do you um, have 3D models of everything that you get pictures of? And the second part we is... Wish, we wish. So oh, so how I wish. wish. Okay. Well, and the second part <coughs> is with virtual reality and some of the other things coming into play, um, how far do you project that coming into play for people to be able to sort of step into space and experience what you're capturing? That's a good question. Well, of course, you get 3D from the surface of Mars. The, the Orion nebula piece is based on real data, yeah. and that's the closest to real 3D. We do a lot of other 3D stuff, which is more of artistic. You want to pick up right. that? I mean, distances in the universe are very poorly known. Okay? We have uh, 100,000 stars that we know their distances too well. The Gaia project will add to that substantially, but you know, that's a pittance when it comes to the 100 billion stars in the galaxy. Uh, the nebula that we look at, um, we can, through scientific intuition, deduce a three-dimensional structure for it, an approximate three-dimensional structure. And um, the team that I'm on, we worked very hard to create those and, and pull those out into 3D and give the experience of a three-dimensional universe. But uh, as we're actually knowing what the, the, the three-dimensional structure of the universe is, it's very difficult. We can give you stars, we can give you distances to a lot of galaxies, um, but the individual nebulae are just really yeah, uh, right. very hard to pull out. Thank you. Yeah. I think what I want to ask is related to that subject. If you go back 25, 30 years ago, the, the conceptualization of space 
among the general public is probably very poor. The size, the, the relative terms used bandied about the confusion between the galaxy and the universe and the star system. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think what you've done over the last 25 years might have contributed to the average person um, being able to imagine this in a, a, a more scientifically accurate way? Um, I think the base impact has been at a visceral level. It has reintroduced the public to what the universe is in, in glorious color. It, it, it was hard to get nice pictures, and particularly color pictures, in the years leading up to Hubble. There, there, there were some, but there, the, we have so many, we have hundreds and hundreds. So most people tell me, a lot of people tell me, they, they're not interested in the science details so much, as opposed to just the glorious, almost religious feel that it gives to them. Certainly in terms of science, it has given us, when you see something 10 times sharper, you, you see more into the complexity. One lesson I've learned from Hubble, to, to paraphrase the scientist Virginia Trimble, um, we, we live in a compulsive universe. If it's allowable within the laws of physics and chemistry, <coughs> it's happening somewhere. And the Hubble pictures have shown us that. We've seen things nobody really thought much about, or they were theoretical ideas. But with Hubble, seeing is believing. So once you see these things, it's like, holy cow, look what's going on. Um, the other thing that's been a huge impact is that makes Hubble so popular in terms of perfect storm. All these pictures are available on the internet. So Hubble's rise in 94, 95 corresponded to the internet, where now you can get all, you can just wallpaper your whole house with these things. That was not possible before the era of, of Hubble. It was hard to get. It was really a very limited supply of interesting space pictures. Well, what about learning that the universe is a lot more violent than we Well, that too, that's yeah. the New York Times in the yeah. it's, it's a violent, it's kind of evening. It's, 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 it's chaos, death, and destruction, and rebirth. No, it's, it's a, I think we, 30 years ago, thought of yeah. the sky as a very no, serene it's different thing. to, uh, yeah. yes. Ray, you mentioned Heidi Hamill. Yeah. She was in charge of the observations here during the week of the uh, Shoemaker-Levy impacts? She was one of the, there was a wonderful team of young astronomers and, and Carl Sagan came here and congratulated them on uh, presenting a new face in men and women, but all 20-something, 30-something. But Heidi confessed to me a few weeks ago, well, they gave it to us because the older guys didn't want to get embarrassed by it. Uh, <laughs> I, do, I, I do street telescoping. Yeah, it's early nineties, the street. And uh, a week, uh, a year after the Shoemaker-Levy impacts, she was interviewed on uh, Science Friday. And one of the things she said was, after the week was over, they went down to the pier, as she put it, and there they found somebody with a little telescope. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't know how heavy it is to pick up. <laughs> but at any rate, she said, we all got in line, and we looked through that little telescope, and that was the most exciting moment of the week for me because I actually saw the impacts with my own eye. Yes, exactly. Now, we look at these pictures, but when you have to take what percentage of the data that Hubble has collected remains yet to be analyzed? It, this is a very important thing. How much data remains to be analyzed? The data will be analyzed for decades. And it's part of the whole flood of data, not just from Hubble, from other observatories. But the, the astronomer today or the next decade could come to work, sit down for coffee, get on a computer and do all their astronomy right there. They don't need observing time with Hubble. No doubt, buried in the archives, the floor below us are extraordinary things yet to be discovered. But I, I guess more to your point is we don't take observations just for obser take to that yeah. point of taking observations. To get that observing time, you, you have to have a really, really, really good proposal <laughs> because only <laughs> one in seven proposals wins. So that when you do get your time, you do analyze your data. Yeah. The point is, is that that data then becomes public and then can be analyzed by others for, for, for decades afterwards. 
But the observations that are taken are not just left there in the archive and like, oh, I don't have time to analyze that data. Because if you don't analyze your Hubble data, there's no way you're going to get more time on Hubble, right? So it's a very efficient system for making sure that people, when they get their data, that only the best science gets the data. And when you get that data, you do do your science with it. But your data doesn't necessarily only answer the question you ask. No, oh, of course. No, yes. no. And that's why the archive is such a valuable resource and the fact that it's public. We're doing more and more press releases based on discoveries from archival. One of the coolest is a movie, which will be out in a, a few months, weeks, whenever I get to it. <laughs> it's of a, uh, a jet from a black hole traveling at over half the speed of light shooting out. The only reason we see the motion is that there was different pictures in the archive from different astronomers over the past 10 years. The fun thing about the story is that if you're, if you're a, a black hole, you need driver's insurance because oh, the, the, the jet is like string of pearls and, and the last blob launched rear-ended the blob in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Three, you know, it's, this is really cool fireworks. And, and, and when you see this, ha you know, it's hard to see movies of anything happening out there. When you see this happening from, from a literal Death Star beam from a black hole in the sky, it hits the other one. That's right, cool. So we got a black hole traffic jam. Uh, the, yes. coming up. Okay, we, we do. We can we do a good headline for that. Well, I've got to <laughs> need some drivers and churns. <laughs> All right, any last questions? <laughs> All right, we're going to be lost at 9.30.